Let's open our Bibles to the book of Jude. The book of Jude. That sounds funny, not saying 2 Peter. It's been so long. We finished up 2 Peter, and we're going to start the very long book of Jude. I, fi- I figure since it takes me so long to get to a book, I better pick a, a, a shorter one. Uh, this is 25 verses long. What I would like for you to do is take this book, and several times as we're going through it, just take it and read it. Uh, on your own and study it a little bit and then when we come here together you'll get more out of the verse by verse if you'll do that the book of Jude is a short book but it's a powerful book and Jude was very much influenced by the apostle Peter and you're going to see that in his writings that he continues some of the same themes that we were looking at in second Peter Uh, Second Peter, I don't know about you, but it challenged me because we began looking at some things of the end times and the way the end times should be shaping our lives, and we're going to look at some of those same things again here in the book of Jude. Uh, We're going to get a long way today in this short book. We're going to get all the way through verse 1, so y'all look together with me to verse 1, obviously in chapter 1. If you go to chapter 2, you've gone too far. Uh, Chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, You can get people like that. Tell them to turn to Jude 3 and hear how many of them just keep looking. Uh, Jude chapter 1 and verse 1. The Bible says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Uh, Jude, of course, identifies himself as the author of this book. Jude is... He says here is the brother of James, uh, not the Apostle James, but the James who wrote the book of James. Uh, Both of these men were half-brothers to Jesus. Uh, If y'all don't mind, we'll we'll turn a few places in the introduction if you want to. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Jesus actually had several brothers and several sisters for that matter. Uh, All of them half-brothers and sisters, of course. Matthew chapter 13, I say half because Joseph was not Jesus' father, we know according to scripture, uh, God himself being his earthly father. Matthew chapter 13, and look all the way down to verse 54. Matthew 13, all the way down to verse 54. I, I want to add this before we read. Uh, There's several times Jesus' brothers are talked about. He had four brothers, in fact. And uh, they did not believe in him. In fact, they even called him crazy and out of his mind until after the resurrection. And and I want you all to consider this for a moment. Uh, What would you think if your brother started saying, I'm God in the flesh? That would be kind of hard to accept, wouldn't it? Uh, It was hard for anyone to accept, but can you imagine his own brothers? And they literally called him crazy. But what a powerful testimony that even his brothers became uh, diligent followers. And we're going to see how much when we go back to our text. But look at Matthew 13 and look at verse 54. We're going to see some of the reasons why his own brothers didn't accept him right here. Verse 54, it says, And when he was come into his own country, in other words, where he was from, He taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished, and said, Whence or where hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? In other words, how did he get all this wisdom? Look at verse 55. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is this not his mother Mary and his brethren? The word brethren there means his brothers. James, Joseph. The word Joseph there is short for Joseph. So this brother was named after his father Joseph. And Simon and Judas, and Judas, Jude is a short, short form of Judas. Uh, notice verse 56. So no, 55, he had four brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Jude. Verse 56, and his sisters. Now, we do not know exactly how many sisters he had, but obviously he had at least two because it's plural here, so he probably had more than two. Uh, now, notice what it goes on to say. Are they not all with us? Whence has this man all these things? And they were offended in him. Why were they offended? Here comes this man back to his hometown to preach, and they're offended. Why are they offended? 
Because they know him. This is the carpenter's son. This is Joseph's boy. How in the world could he be saying these things? Now you can see kind of why uh, his own brothers didn't believe in him. His own brothers would call him crazy. Look what Jesus goes on to say. But Jesus said in them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. He acknowledges right here, there is no honor even in his hometown, even in his own house. Did you know what the Bible says about Mary? Mary, now by the time of the marriage at Cana of Galilee, she already knew who Jesus was. But early on, even at the birth of Jesus, she had no clue. She was so confused by what was going on, even with the angel talking to her. The Bible talks about the shepherds that came and worshipped to remember the baby. And the Bible says Mary just pondered all these things in her heart. In other words, she was thinking, what in the world is going on? Even when Jesus was 12 years old, remember, and, and uh, he kind of uh, stayed at the temple while the parents left, and they came back three days later and said, what in the world are you doing? I'm paraphrasing. And Jesus said, don't you know I have to be about my father's business? She still hadn't got it yet, okay? Uh, all of these brothers and all of these sisters and Mary, they were all there at his first miracle. And I already told you what it was, but do you all remember what his first miracle was? Turning the water into wine, the marriage of Canaan of Galilee. So they saw these things, but none of those things convinced his brothers. It wasn't until after the resurrection. Now keeping that in mind, turn back to Jude, and I want to show you what Jude says about himself. This is so powerful. Uh, we talk about the Bible having internal and external evidences that it's true. Here's one of these things that Jude was another man that was killed for his witness of Jesus, okay? This is a, a half-brother of Jesus that said Jesus was out of his mind. Look how Jude identifies himself in this book. He don't say the brother of Jesus. What does he say? Jude the servant. Of Jesus. If you look at that word in the Greek, is the bond slave, the willing slave of Jesus. I'll tell you a little bit more about that word in a minute. But why didn't he call him his brother? Wouldn't this be something you'd be proud about? Of course, I don't know the mind of Jude, but I believe it would be because Jude felt unworthy to be called the brother of Jesus. How could you be called the brother of God? I think Jude came to the moment just like Thomas did when Thomas fell down before him and said, My Lord and my God. Thomas finally got it. You all remember when Thomas got it? After the resurrection. These men that were with him day and night didn't get it until after the resurrection. Here is his half-brother that didn't get it until after the resurrection. In Acts chapter 1, we have uh, all of his brothers a part of the first church. That's what's wonderful. They called him crazy, but now they're all a part of the first church when the church was 120 people in the upper room. Isn't that great? What a witness to the power of the resurrection and the power of God. Now let's talk about this word servant a minute. Uh, we in our culture don't know what a bond slave is. What is a bond slave? Let me tell you a little bit about uh, the culture because most people here think slavery is terrible and and all those things. Slavery was actually built into the law. And it wasn't like what we think of as slavery. The way we think of slavery is terrible. Uh, if someone owed a terrible debt and couldn't pay it, uh, there was no such thing as bankruptcy in the law. Uh, you had to pay it. And if you had no money to pay it, guess what happened? You went in servitude to the people you owed. You had to work off your debt. Uh, that was in the law. Maybe things would be a little bit better today in our country if people realized they had to pay off their debts instead of believing the government needed to give them everything. Uh, that's just uh, my own opinion. But uh, God's law never gave these uh, entitlements. So they went in servitude to these people. Now when their debt was paid or at the end of six years, they could not work for more than six years. Why was that? I'm giving y'all trivia questions today. The seventh, year was holy. the seventh year was holy, absolutely. The seventh year they had to be released from service. So if their debt wasn't paid up in six years, they got to go free. 
However, now this is where the wonderful things come and we can't fathom this. At the end of that six years, the, the slave had the willing choice to stay as a servant of the master. You say, why in the world would someone ever want to stay with their master? You know, the, the law also gave provision of how the master was to treat the servant. They weren't supposed to abuse them. They were supposed to take care of them. They were supposed to take care of their family. Many of them were taken care of better than any job they had ever been at. So many times they would willingly become a bond slave to their master and say, for life, I'm going to be the servant of this person. And it was good for them knowing that they were going to be taken care of and their family was going to be taken care of. It was a beautiful picture of the trust that someone had in the master. This is the word that Jude uses. I am a bond slave. I have willingly put myself as a slave of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Going from calling him crazy to saying I'm his bond slave. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the culture. Do y'all mind turning one other place? Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15. There was a ceremony that would take place when the person uh, would become a bond slave. Does any? I'm getting one more trivia question. Does anybody know what they would do to the servant to show that he was going to be a lifelong servant? Deuteronomy 15. <clears throat> All these boys you see that's got earrings in their ears, uh, what it really means is they're a slave. <laughs> that's, the, that's the very first time that men had earrings. It was to show that they were a slave for life, that they were a willing bond slave. Deuteronomy 15 and look down to verse 12. Deuteronomy 15 and verse 12. I want you to read these words because some people can, again, just say, how in the world could anybody want to be a slave? Verse 12, if thy brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. And when thou sendest him out, verse 13, free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. You see, here he's saying, you don't, you don't let him go with nothing. Look what it says. And when thou sendest him out free with thee, Thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou, verse 14, thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy winepress of that wherewith the Lord God hath blessed thee. Thou shalt give unto him. So again, it's not the way we think of master and slave right here. He says you provide for this person a way to go out and make a living for themselves if that's what they want to do. Verse 15, thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. And the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore I command thee this thing today. In other words, don't be a taskmaster like the Egyptians were over you. Be a good landlord. Verse 16. And it shall be if he shall say unto thee, I will not go away from thee, because he loveth thee and thine house, and because he is well with thee. In other words, everything's going great. He don't want to leave. He loves you. He trusts you. You're taking care of him. He don't want to go. He wants to work for you for the rest of his life. Look what it says. Verse 17. Then thou shalt take an awl. An awl was a, a metal rod that they were going to, it's just a way to pierce an ear. And I'm, my ear's already, I got an earache anyway, and that hurts my ear. And they thrust it through his ear unto the door. In other words, they, they would have this ceremony at the door of the master's house. And they would thrust it through his ear. And he shall be thy servant forever. And also unto thy maidservant. In other words, if it's a woman, you will do likewise. So this was a symbol, a sign to everyone that he was a willing bond slave. Well, I wish we had something that showed that we were a lifelong, willing bond slave of Jesus. Wouldn't that be good? There's a lot of things people try. They will try uh, crosses on necklaces or fish on their car. But is there a God-given sign that we are Jesus' bond slave for eternity? Is there something He commands us to do to show the world? Is there a ceremony? Come on, y'all, help me that shows the world, I am a slave of Jesus, I'm going to walk in newness of life, I'm going to serve Him willingly for life. We call that our baptism. Amen? Baptism. Amen. Do you, did you think at your baptism that was what you were doing? 
saying, I am going to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. I'm becoming a willing slave of Him. No longer am I going to live for me. I'm going to live for Him. Isn't that beautiful? Go back to our text as we're thinking about these things. Uh, I wonder sometimes why anyone that says they are a child of God, why in the world would they not want to identify themselves with Jesus? Number one, God commanded us to do this. Why would they not want to do it? Uh, my plea to anyone who does not have scriptural baptism, make the willing choice to follow Jesus and to show the world that you're going to follow Him. By scriptural baptism, y'all quickly get this, I mean four things. Number one, you have to be the proper candidate. Uh, you have to be saved before you go into the water. Uh, and, and you're going to understand that when we get to the next ones. But uh, obviously, uh, remember the people that came to John the Baptist and said they wanted to be baptized? What did John say? Show me proof that you've repented. In other words, they, they, hadn't, they hadn't placed their faith in Christ. They, haven't, they hadn't repented to God. So you have to have the proper candidate, number one. Number two, you have to have the proper way. You have to be dumped. You've got to be put under. You have to be uh, buried in the likeness of His death. If you're sprinkled or poured, uh, you just got wet. You didn't have proper baptism. Number three, you've got to do it for the proper reason. It's not for salvation. It is a commitment to God. It is a commitment to God. Uh, you know, does anybody know where we got our name as Baptists? Y'all know what Baptist means, don't you? Baptist means, come on, John the Baptist. John the Immerser. John the Baptizer. John the Immerser. That's what it means. We are the Immersers. In fact, we got our name, we used to be called the Anna Baptist. Not anti, Anna. Which means to re-baptize. To re-dunk. In other words, anyone that would come from the Catholic Church or anywhere else, guess what we did? We redunked them. You say, well, is there anything in the Bible about rebaptizing? Absolutely. Do y'all remember the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 19 came across believers? They were believers. The Bible tells us they were saved, they were disciples, but yet they had a wrong baptism. And the Bible says that Paul then baptized them, they became. Uh, a member of the church, and then they received the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which was given to the first church. So it has to be for the proper reason. And then number four, it has to be the proper authority. In other words, it has to be a New Testament church. And what I mean by that, it has to be a church that fits exactly the pattern of God's uh, New Testament churches. So all of those things are required to have proper baptism. Somebody might say, well, I'm not sure if I have proper baptism." Uh, I'm not sure if I knew what it was when I was baptized. I'm not sure of where I was baptized, or I'm not sure why I was baptized. Can I say something? I, I don't know why we have a stigmatism over this. If you're not sure, there's one easy way to get sure. You say, well, I don't want to do something I don't need to do. Uh, let's see. Would it be God-honoring to say, have a ceremony that shows Jesus is death, burial, and resurrection, and you say, I want to serve Him with my life. Is that God honoring? You say, well, I may have already done that. And you do it twice. Wow, that's bad, isn't it? No, it's not bad. Not bad at all. But what if you don't have scripture baptism? That is bad, amen? Be sure. Amen? Be sure. Uh, you say, Brother Chris, you're preaching the choir. I have scripture baptism. Then I'm going to ask you, are you doing what it showed? Jude said, I am a bond slave of Jesus. Does anybody doubt that Jude was a bond slave of Jesus? He died for Jesus. He preached, he lived, and he died for Jesus. We did the very thing of getting the earring. I'm glad God didn't require an earring. Y'all say amen. I'm glad he just said be baptized. But those of us who've been baptized correctly, that's exactly what we said. We're going to follow Him for our life. We're going to be His bond slave. Are you following through on your baptism? What a beautiful thing as we look at it. This book was written in 69 A.D. Uh, the book we just got through with was written in 67 A.D. I told you that uh, he was very much influenced by Peter's writing. 
Uh, please look down to verse 3 back in Jude, and I'm going to show you the very purpose of this book. It's also the key verse of this book. Verse 3, he said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the, com of the common salvation... Uh, let me just put that in words. It's easy to understand. I wanted to write and talk about salvation. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we could just talk about salvation all the time? That would be great because salvation is wonderful. It's the best thing we've got on earth. But look what he says. But it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The faith is talking about the doctrines, the teachings of Jesus Christ. He said it was needful for me, instead of just talking about salvation, to tell you to fight for the faith. The word contend there means to fight. Let me ask you, if it was needful for them to fight for the doctrines of God back then, is it needful for us to fight today? How do we fight for God's doctrines? Number one, be a part of a church that is striving to protect God's doctrines. Amen? Are there some churches that are not striving to protect God's doctrines? There's some out there that say, we don't even talk about doctrine. Guys, that's not scriptural at all. Number one, the word doctrine means teaching, okay? If, if you don't have doctrine, you don't have anything. And right here, the Bible says that we should contend. We should be fighting for God's doctrines. It is God's doctrines that changes lives. It is God's doctrines that pleases Him if we follow so first, be a part of a church that contends for His doctrines. Then what? What can I do as a person? Learn God's Word. Amen. Follow through on that baptism. Say, I'm going to follow Jesus and learn of the doctor, doctrines. And by the way, that's a never-ending study at home and at church. And then, when you learn them, you live them, and you tell people. Isn't that easy? You know, God made it easy. He didn't make it hard. Uh, very good devotional this morning from, uh, I would have even thought that if it wasn't my father. I might have thought it more if it wasn't my daughter. Uh, very good devotional about how the uh, pew can help the pulpit. Uh, this is very much a team effort. And I'll tell you this, as your pastor, we need you as a part of Panola Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, look around, Panola needs a lot. And it's going to take people to give Panola what it needs. Amen. We need every person that is here today and even some that are home. We need you. If God has brought you here, He's brought you here to serve. Uh, do what you need to do to be a part. Truly be a part of our church. And uh, I believe God will bless you. Uh, we had a lesson in our Sunday school class today about God ordained that you serve Him through a New Testament church. Do y'all believe that? I asked my class, can you serve God outside of church? Now, now stop before you answer. Just think about that. Can you serve God outside of a church? Sure. I can live for God. I can tell people about God. But you can't fully please God because He ordained and commanded us that glory should come through the church. Amen? And then my question was, why in the world... Would He put us together? You know, there's some people that don't come to church because of problems. Y'all listen to this. This is really good. Do y'all think the first church had problems? Jesus was the pastor, right? Uh, they had someone that betrayed the pastor to death. I would say they had problems. Okay, But there was other things that went on. They had another member that uh, cursed the pastor and denied him three times. They had two members that, that literally, we talked about them a lot in our Sunday school class. They had Simon, who was a zealot. That means he wanted to overthrow the Roman government. They had Matthew, who was a tax collector. That means he worked for the Roman government, taking money away from the Jews. I bet they had some good conversations, don't you? Yeah, there you go. That's right. Uh, they had a big service where there was thousands of visitors, and they all got mad and left. That was true in John chapter 6. Uh, they had problems. So again, I go back, why in the world did he put them together knowing that there would be problems? Uh, can I ask y'all to refocus? Maybe God has a purpose for the problems too. Amen? Uh, 
Is everybody in the world going to be easy to get along with when you leave these doors? <coughs> and we're supposed to take the loving message of God out there. Maybe one of the purposes for church is so that we can learn and learn how to get along with people that maybe uh, we don't mesh with. But if we can't get along with each other here, how are we going to witness to those out in the world? Jesus even said, love your enemies. Amen? The whole purpose is God put us together for a reason. Even sometimes the things that we don't like that go on in church, God allows for a reason to strengthen us if we look at it right. But we've got to look at it right. And we have to understand we all have weaknesses. Again, I'm going to tell you, we need you as a part of this church. Uh, and God wants you to be a part of a church somewhere anyway. As we go on down, please look at the last part of verse 1. And this is what we'll focus on uh, in the end. Who this letter was written to. And this is beautiful. We know that Jude wrote it, but look what it says. He says, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. He calls them three things. Sanctified, he calls them preserved, and he calls them called. This is beautiful. Uh, we may have to, believe it or not, we may have to talk about this some more tonight. There's so much there. But let's look at them one at a time very quickly. He says, first, sanctified by God. Don't know why they translate it this way. The word is agape, and I bet everyone in this room knows what agape should be translated. Come on, y'all shout it out. What is agape? Love. love. So look at this verse and tell me what it is. They are loved by God. Everybody see that? He says, I'm writing to those that are loved, that, that godly love, that agape love, loved by God the Father. When I first looked at this, I thought, well, God the Father loves everybody. But then you start looking, it's a little deeper than that. God loves everybody, absolutely. But God's love doesn't benefit everybody. God's love only benefits those that allow Him to love them. Do you understand what I'm saying? God has provided so much for me and you. Oh, y'all get this. But if we don't allow that into our life, guess what? We miss out on all the blessings. Two quick ways that God's love is provided for us. Number one, salvation. Y'all get that easy, amen? Obviously, you have to accept Jesus as your Savior to enjoy the love of God for eternity. But also, we as people that are saved, do we not also have to accept God's love on a daily basis? Does He not want to provide for us, to protect us, to bless us on a daily basis? Let me ask you, if a mother tells the child, don't cross the street when you're playing, and the child doesn't listen to the mom, are they being loved and protected by the mom? Well, you say the mom's love hadn't changed, but what changes? They get outside that protection, don't they? What happens when we, even as His children, fail to do what He wants us to do? Come on, y'all tell me. We open ourselves up to the consequences of this world. You say, now wait a minute, Brother Chris. The Bible says there is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. Y'all say amen. amen. We're going to get to that. That's the next word, preserved. We are eternally secure in Christ. We're going to get to that, I promise. What I'm talking about is the blessings and the protection in this life. He wants to help you avoid the consequences in this life. And He wants to bless you in this life and rewards in the life to come. Can we cause ourselves to miss those? The Bible says there's going to be people at the judgment, saved people, that every work they had on earth, the Bible says, is going to be burned up. It's going to be gone. The only thing that's going to be left is their salvation. Praise the Lord, they're going to be saved. But no rewards, no treasure, nothing for eternity. Well, isn't that sad? Do you love God? You say yes. Does God love you? Look who Jude's writing to, and I want you to think about it. He starts by saying those that are sanctified, loved by the Father. Again, the idea of those that are allowing God the Father to love them if you're going to allow your parent to love them you have to listen to them 
You have to listen to their love. If you're going to allow God to love him, you have to listen to him. Do y'all mind turning the place with me? Y'all turn over. Uh, let's see, where do I want to go? Turn over to 1 John. That's where I thought I was going. 1 John, just a couple of pages. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And look down to verse 5. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 5. First John chapter 2 and verse 5. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. The word perfected there means it fully accomplishes. God's love fully accomplishes what God wants it to accomplish. Who is the one that, that God's love accomplishes? What does it say? He that keepeth his word. In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in Him. Look at verse 6. He that saith he abided in Him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. In other words, if we say we love Him, what should we do? We should follow Him. I want you to think back to everything we've talked about today. Jude, a bond slave of Jesus. We went back to Deuteronomy and we saw that a slave that loved his master so and trusted his master so that he said, I want to be a slave for eternity. It was because he trusted him. He loved him. He knew he was going to take care of him. How many of us have truly reached out to God in that kind of trust and say, I know you're going to take care of me. Guys, he's got you eternally. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But do you trust him on a daily basis? Do you allow his love to protect you on a daily basis. Look at that verse 5. Who does it say that God's love is perfected in? God's love accomplishes. But whoso keepeth His word. The more we follow Him in our life, the more we listen to Him, the more we allow His word to shape our life, the more we're protected. Don't play around that light socket. Now, you can love a child as much as you want, but if they go with a paper clip and stick it in the light socket, what's going to happen? God loves you, but you go stick your hand in sin, what's going to happen? Amen? It's easy to see. Turn back to our text. Let's see this next one that is beautiful. He says, love by God. Are you right now allowing God to love you? You say, I know God loves me. No, are you allowing His love to accomplish what it should accomplish. Sadly, we look at the next one and that's where we hover because it's so beautiful. But notice what it says. Preserved in Jesus Christ. The word preserved means kept safe, guarded. We are literally guarded by Jesus Christ. If you have reached out to God in faith through Jesus Christ, let me tell you what you have. You have a salvation that is not dependent on you. It is dependent on Jesus. The Bible says it is by His life you are kept safe. Oh, the book of Hebrews says something beautiful. It says that He is able to save us to the uttermost. The word uttermost means absolutely, completely, thoroughly until the end of time because He forever lives to make intercession for the saints. In other words, He is every day in heaven keeping you saved. Somebody say amen. amen. Your salvation is guarded by Jesus. Now let me warn you. Good old missionary Baptist. You know, we, we beat up on the Catholics sometimes. Uh, they have something that is called indulgences. Y'all know what an indulgence is? Uh, there was a reason all the mobsters were Catholics back in the day. An indulgence is if you have a certain sin in your life, you go to the church and you confess it and you have to pay a certain amount for a certain sin. Uh, if it's a little sin, you know, you pay a little bit of money. If it's a big sin, you pay more money. Uh, they got to the point that you could actually pay in advance. Uh, I think I'm going to commit a murder tomorrow, so I better pay you whatever, whatever the amount of money is. Now, we laugh at that, and it's, it is sad, isn't it? It's very sad. Uh, it would be funny if it wasn't so serious. But sometimes we missionary Baptists almost use the grace of God like that. 
we almost think, well, I'm saved. God forgives me. Uh, how can I say it? Maybe the Catholics at least have respect to pay them some money when they do it wrong. <laughs> we don't even do that. Are you living the life like a loved, preserved child of God? Will y'all turn to Romans 5? I, probably the last place I'll have you turn. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I want you to understand what Jesus is doing for you every day. I told you that He is in heaven every day. The Bible says He is living to make intercession for you. Every sin you have, He says, it is paid for. Romans chapter 5, please look down to verse 8. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God commendeth His love. Everybody with me? Romans 5 and verse 8. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, He died for you long before you were even born, long before you even recognized you had a need, long before you asked for anything, He did something for you. Now please look at the next two words. What, what does it say? What are the first two words in verse 9? Much more. There's something, did you know there's something greater than the death of Jesus Christ? Look what it says. Much more than being justified, now being justified by His blood, we shall, future tense, be saved from wrath through Him. Verse 10. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, there's those words again, much more being reconciled, we shall, future tense, be saved by His, what? Life. His death saved us, past tense. His life keeps us saved. We are preserved because Jesus lives. Y'all can say amen. That's some good stuff. Jude is writing to those that are allowing God to love them and those that are preserved in Jesus Christ. You know, as we sit here today, most, most times a preacher preaches. He is preaching to a congregation of people that have professed to be saved. Now don't get me wrong, there's always a few scattered in that haven't. Mostly he's preaching to people that are scripturally baptized and even members of the church. You say, preacher, you talk about salvation, you talk about baptism, I've got all that. I'm going to keep going back to, are we living like that? Are we living like the bond slave? Please look at our text again. The very last thing and the last word that they, that Jude calls these people. And it's so powerful. What is it? Called. What does that mean, preacher? Everybody in here knows what it means to be called because I'm sure sometime in your past life somebody called you. And I don't mean on the phone. I mean the good old days when mama would open the screen door and go, boys, get in here, it's supper time. Y'all remember those days? Your name was called for a specific task at a specific time for a specific reason. Y'all remember those days? Uh, we had a big backyard, plus we had woods in the back, and me and David would always go back in the woods and, and uh, Mom would call, and if we couldn't hear, then Dad would whistle, and we didn't have any excuse because everybody can hear Dad whistle. If you've ever heard him whistle, you know what I mean. Uh, you can be a uh, hundred yards off, and your ears will ring when he whistles. Uh, so when we heard that, we knew, you know, it's time to go. Now, we had the choice, well, I can either sit out here and keep playing, <laughs> or I can go because Mom and Daddy's calling. Look and think about it in this sense. God is calling you. Do you believe God is calling you? Every one of His children are called to His service. Now I can sit here and preach you an hour long sermon and show you all the scriptures, but I think you all know that. It's just like your mom and daddy calling your name. You have the choice to keep playing or to come to His call and surrender to His call. Isn't that beautiful when you think about it? You say, Brother Chris, what, what does God want from me? 
What do I need to do? You know, I can go through the list and all these things. Again, when a preacher's talking to a room full of people, there's so many different needs, both physical and spiritual. There's some in this auditorium that need to make physical moves. There's some here that's never professed salvation. You have a desperate need of a Savior and a relationship with God Almighty. There's some in this room that's not had scriptural baptism. It's in God's will for you to do that. Again, can you serve Him outside of that? Yeah. But you can't fully please Him. There's some in here that aren't members. Does God want you to be a member of one of His New Testament churches? Absolutely. Can I ask y'all just a simple question? Do y'all believe that uh, God works in your everyday life and even situations? Have y'all ever had certain things happen? Uh, not to tell a long story, but I had car trouble one day. We had car trouble one day. And in my normal nature, it upset me, you know, this and that. And then you find out later, hey, there was a car wreck down the road about that time. Have you all ever experienced something like that? Do you think God works in your life in little situations all the time? Do you believe that God has you here today for a reason? I believe He does. I love the song. We normally sing it as an invitation. Scott, are you leading... I'll let you look it up. I know you probably have one. But there's, uh, I Can Hear My Savior Calling. Is that the name of it? Love that song. Y'all know how that song goes? I can hear my Savior calling. Can you ever hear God calling? This is what you need to do in your life. Right here, Jude said he's writing to the called. The idea of that word is those that have answered the call. Okay? I believe God calls everyone to salvation. Amen. And then He calls every one of His children to church members, baptism, church membership, and service. But the idea of that is those that have answered the call. <clears throat> there was one time I didn't answer my mama's call. And boy, I regret it to this day. I could tell the long story, but I won't. You know, we have the choice today. We hear God's call. We can keep playing or we can run to our Heavenly Father. Instead of me going through the list, let me ask you, can you hear God calling you in your life? Is there a move that He wants you to make? A change that He wants you to make? Y'all know how that song ends? I'll go with Him, with Him, all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. Beautiful song, but it's more beautiful when you apply it to your life. Will you follow him today? Father, as we humbly bow in your presence, we thank you for bringing us here today, and we acknowledge that it is your power that brought us here. Father, we thank you for giving us your word. And above all things, we thank you for loving us, loving us enough to call us. To literally call us by name. Though we don't hear your audible voice, we've heard you through your word. We've heard you through our loved ones. We've heard you through teachers and preachers. We've heard you just as plainly if you were saying our name. Father, I thank you so many years ago I heard you calling me to salvation in my need of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you today that I still hear you calling me to serve you. Even with all my failures, I still feel your pull and hear your voice. Father, help me and help us all not to be stubborn, 
not to just go about and keep doing our own thing, but to turn at your call and to come to you. Father, if there's moves that need to be made today in lives, I pray that your spirit is working so that they can hear your call. Maybe there's one here that hasn't called out to you in faith. Oh, Father, we pray for them. We pray that your conviction would be such that they would have to at least ask someone what they need to do. Father, maybe there's one here that wants to follow you in baptism. Maybe it's church membership. Maybe it's rededicating their life. Whatever it may be, Father. Maybe it's just simple changes in our life that need to be made. Help us to hear your voice loud and clear and to follow the words of the song and say, I'll go with you all the way. Father, help us to remember back those of us that have it and say, I followed you and gave you my life. Help us to once again be that slave to the best master of all. Thank you for loving us so and taking care of us when we follow you. Be with us right now during this invitation time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.